This is the Brabant Bulletin brought to you by the European Brabant Registry of America, where people, passion, and preservation are our mission. Hey everybody, I am Stacy, your host for today, and our topic of discussion is chronic progressive lymphedema, also known as CPL. A horse with CPL does not mean the end of a working life for that horse. As long as they are sound and comfortable, they can do just as well as a non-CPL horse. This is according to Hannah Johansson. If you haven't visited www.chronicprogressivelymphedema.com, I encourage you to do so. She also has a Facebook page with a lot of engagement, so get on there. Okay, let's dive right in. I'm going to preface this podcast by saying that I am not a doctor of veterinary medicine or an authority on equine health. If you have any concerns, please always refer to your vet. Everything that I've referred to in this podcast was referenced from about 100 different published studies, research literature, theories, and a smattering of draft horse community forums. I've done my best to boil it down and simplify it, but not oversimplify it. And hopefully this information about CPL will give you an idea of how it impacts our draft horses and how to treat it and how to hopefully manage the situation. Now, I know I just said I referenced a lot of different articles and a lot of different um, medical journals, but I will say there's still a lot about CPL that we don't know. Much of what we do know or has been circulated amongst the draft horse community is really based on old research, um, and these studies are about 20 years old, often laser-focused mainly or not limited to genetics, skin, and lymph. Some researchers theorize that CPL is due to heavy bone and feathering, but even lightly boned and lightly feathered horses horses have CPL. So this suggests it's based in the genetics. And while geneticists identified a whole genome scan for chronic pastern dermatitis in 2009, it has yet to identify a CPL gene. Some folks theorize that it's a multifactorial disease and is brought on by a chain reaction of genetic predisposition, mite infestation, skin sensitivity, prolonged inflammatory immune response, living conditions, lack of exercise, diet, hoof health, gender, and more. That's crazy, right? That's a lot. Okay, but I'm getting ahead of myself. For those of you who are unfamiliar with chronic progressive lymphedema, aka CPL, here's the cliff notes. Before CPL became the mainstream terminology for this condition, it was often referred to as chronic pastern dermatitis, or CPD, or chronic proliferative pastern dermatitis, CPPD, a term still used by vets across the USA and Canada. In 2003, the syndrome was redefined as chronic progressive lymphedema, CPL, mainly because of its similarities to the clinical presentations within the human condition, which we now know as chronic lymphedema. It should be noted that this is a bit misleading for horse owners. Given the equine chronic lymphedema, symptoms are assumed to be secondary to or as a result of CPD. I need to restate here that there is presently no causation and manner of the disease development of CPL to date. So all of this is just theory. No matter the accuracy of the term of CPL, let's break down what CPL is exactly. It's said to be a multifactorial disease that occurs in several heavy draft horse breeds, some light horse breeds, some draft crosses, and even some mules. Typically, clinical symptoms start in the lower limbs and include progressive soft tissue swelling and fibrosis. That's thickening and scarring of the skin tissue. Along with the development of skin folds and nodules, skin issues may include excessive scaling and ulcers. Secondary conditions can sometimes develop as a consequence of the primary CPL lesions as well. Additionally, hyperkeratonic skin provides an ideal environment for mites, which triggers a chain reaction of events leading to the onset of CPL. For example, mites aggravate the skin, so the horse scratches and itches. We've all seen our horses do it. In the process of aggressively biting their irritated legs, they break the skin and bacteria infiltrates. The skin becomes inflamed and as a result, that prolonged inflammation impedes the lymph drainage system. Since a dysfunctional lymphatic system directly impacts the skin's ability to fight infection, bacteria grows and it spreads. This infection worsens and the leg swells even more. You can see where I'm going here, it's a chain reaction. Swelling causes the skin to crack and flake and with dead skin, and guess what? 
mites love dead skin. It's their favorite meal. So mites settle in, they reproduce, and it's a vicious cycle. Horses scratch and it starts all over again. Between these skin folds, dirt and moisture can accumulate, creating opportunities for secondary and even and even tertiary infections and fungal infections. These secondary skin infections can produce foul smelling excudate. That's a special word for fluids and ulcers. Flies are attracted to that smell. And in some worst case scenarios, there's a maggot infestation that can occur. Dr. Marie K. Bres of the University of Ghent says, CPL is 86% environmental and 14% genetics. That means the way the horse is fed, their activity level, where and how they live, their preventive mite care, grooming, all of it factors 86% of whether that horse will develop and or progress with CPL symptoms and how severe those symptoms will become. The speed of CPL progression is largely dependent on additional influences such as hygiene, skin care, secondary infections, and trauma. Lymphedema will have an effect on the dermis, the subcutis, and the tissues in the distal legs. In more advanced stages, dermal thickening can also be so severe that it encloses the entire leg, typically at the level of the joints resulting in the restriction of the horse's movements. This can cause a certain degree of lameness, and in most extreme cases, humane euthanasia is required. Okay, that's like worst case scenario. So let's look at a big picture. CPL has been observed in several breeds to include, but not limited to, European Brabants, American Brabants, Shires, Clydesdales, Gypsy Cobs, and Vanners, and Frisians, American Belgians, Arden, Breton, Bolognese, Cheval de Trade, Sios, Percherons, and German Drafts. All of these breeds, uh, including the Black Forest Horse, the Schleswig, the Saxon Thuringian, the German Rhenish, the Mecklenburg, it goes on. One study estimates over 85% of the European Brabant breed is affected, while some other studies estimate a conservative number around 60%. Either way, why is CPL happening in this breed and other breeds? Again, it's theorized that CPL has an unidentified genetic component and breeds with limiting breeding numbers, like many draft breeds, demonstrate a higher incidence of CPL due to the recirculated gene pool. Based on this theory, for Brabants, it's a numbers game. According to trekpard.net, the current number of Brabants in Belgium are roughly around 5,000. That's estimated about 550 foals born annually. That's not a lot. Um, that's also crazy considering that the horse once boasts 278,000 horses in Belgium. But go listen to episode one. You'll hear about the evolution of the breed and its history. At any rate, a byproduct of having very few breeding horses to keep the breed going early on was inbreeding with present day CPL incidence rates somewhere between 60 and 85% of all Brabants, it's safe to assume a genetic predisposition was carried forward from those foundation draft horses all those years ago. The very same gene, which is now theorized by some to be the cause of CPL onset. More on skin sensitivity later. Okay, in small populations, the choice of mates is also limited. Over time, individuals will become related and will be forced to mate with relatives. This is inbreeding. Inbred animals have two identical alleles for their genes because the same gene was passed on by both parents. If this allele has harmful mutations, an inbred baby can be unhealthy, says Dr. Melissa Minter, research at the University of York in the United Kingdom. Today, European associations have been working toward breeding out CPL. Two methods of selection against CPL are the phenotypic selection and estimated breeding values. That's called EBV for short. Essentially, EBV provides the measurement of the breeding potential of any animal for a specific trait. They take into account performance data collected by known relatives, the relationships between performance traits, and the degree in which traits are inherited from one generation to the next. That's called heritabilities. The European stud books adopted the phenotypic selection, which presently evaluates the sc and scores breeding stallions' legs during annual stallion selections. Quote, Phenotypical breeding has been largely ineffective in reducing CPL, says Dr. Brace. That has been proven here in Belgium over years and years of scoring and selective breeding based on stallions' legs. A better approach would be to assess the stallion's offspring, end quote. 
As Dr. Bryce has pointed out, CPL has a low to moderate heritability, about 14 to 26%, resulting in a low efficiency of phenotypic selection. Therefore, some say EBVs would be likely to render better results. As an aside, we at the European Vermont Registry of America face the same breeding challenges on this side of the Atlantic as our friends in Belgium. In some respects, it's even more difficult as the purebred Brabant is so much more rare here. Quote, if genetic diversity gets too low, species can go extinct and be lost forever. This is according to Dr. Melissa Minter. This is due to the combined effects of inbreeding and depression and failure to adopt to change. In such cases, the introduction of new alleles can save a population. This is called genetic rescue, a conservation strategy where new individuals are introduced into the population to increase genetic diversity and to improve population health. End quote. In an effort to avoid inbreeding and to broaden our gene pool, the EBRA developed the BreedUp program. This is where breeders have the ability to selectively cover outside phenotypic draft horses with purebred Brabants and breed up to the purebred standard threshold of 15 sixteenths or 93.75% European Brabant bloodlines. These qualified breed up Brabants are then evaluated and scored for breed standards by a panel of independent judges. Those who pass inspection are included in the EBRA's premier purebred stud book. This program allows us to preserve the heritage breed while also introducing fresh outside blood to the genetic mix. As Dr. Minter noted, genetic diversity improves the overall health of any species. It should be noted again that many heavy draft horses are susceptible to developing CPL, so even this approach may not be wholly effective in breeding out CPL. Only time will tell. We can do what we can do at the EBRA, and at this time, we can help contribute to research studies and suggest best prevention and treatment practices within our Brabant community and to help reduce inbreeding through the BreedUp program. We also have our grassroots testimating app where EBRA members can virtually pair Brabants to see how genetically overlapped these horses may be if they're crossed. So all of these things we're trying to do to help lessen CPL incidents within the breed and improve the breed itself. Okay, so now, why does CPL start in the first place? To date, there's been a lot of theories and speculation, but nothing concrete. That's where Dr. Marike Brais, uh, the master of veterinary medicine from the university, again, I mentioned earlier, her studies come into the picture. She's dedicated two years of study to CPL and wrote a dissertation titled, titled Chronic Progressive Lymphedema in Draft Horses, Mites or Myth. She has committed another six years of her life to the continuation of her CPL study and as the owner of a Brabant mare herself with CPL, she sought answers on how to care for her and to treat her. She noticed a gap from the study of the disease to any viable recommendations regarding treatments for the condition. After poring over all the available resources from science-based research to Facebook CPL groups and to talking to equine lymph drainage practitioners and supplement developers, Dr. Brace landed on the mite theory. She suspected that non-burrowing mites, or coreoptic bovis, or C. bovis for short, are what ignite this chain reaction leading to the onset of CPL. Her hypothesis was that if she could eradicate the infestation, she could begin to heal her mare's legs. In draft horses, a remarkably high prevalence of mites has been described in several studies, ranging from 50% to 90%. Let me say this again, 50% to 90% of horses have mites. As described in the previous example, these C. bovis mites can cause itchy skin, scaling and crusting of the distal limbs, and this skin scaling and epidural debris in turn provides abundant food for the mighty mites. That vicious cycle I talked about. Not only is there ample food, but the feathers provide shelter from the elements too, so it's a nice little cozy house. Essentially, draft horse feathers are the penthouse of mite real estate. So Marike eliminated the mite's shelter by clipping the feathers. Then she exterminated the infestation by applying Cydectin. Listen, uh, just a side note, Cydectin is currently not approved for horses in the U.S. Anyway, at marked intervals, she used Cydectin to cut off the life cycle of mites. For safety purposes, do not attempt to use this treatment without the guidance of a licensed veterinarian. Again, Sedectin is not approved for horses in the USA. 
Foals and yearlings should never be treated with cydactin. Just like parasites becoming resistant to dewormers, you should know that there is a potential for mites to become tolerant to topical treatments like cydactin. Okay, over time, uh, Dr. Brace's leg, mare's legs improved. Swelling reduced significantly and the sores healed. Her mare no longer scratched or stomped. And to reinforce her theory, she expanded the study to other CPL affected horses. She established a placebo controlled approach. Once again, the same promising results. That's pretty great. As I mentioned before, she is continuing the study and expanding her research to include biopsies so she can further study the long-term impacts of CPL on horses' lymphatic sy systems and their skin. Dr. Bray says the dysfunction of the lymphatic system, fibrosis, inflammation, and the aberrant elastin network are the four factors that appear to be associated with CPL and provide the basis of her hypothesis. But the timeline of these events is not actually clear. For example, lymphedema can cause inflammation and fibrosis. Conversely, chronic inflammation can also cause a malfunctioning lymphatic system. A vicious circle can be created where these factors might permanently reinforce one another. Therefore, no one trigger factor for this condition has yet been identified. Consequently, several diverging hypotheses have been formulated regarding the cause of the disorder. Quote, I believe it is possible that current hypotheses are not independent of each other, says Dr. Brace. Rather, each may explain part of the disorder development, the genotype, environmental interaction is defined as different effect of a certain genotype on the disease risk in the animal with different environmental exposures, end quote. Okay, so what is she saying? Well, I think what she's saying is a horse that's genetically predisposed, depending on where they live, if they live in a dry lot with lots of mud, that may be a factor. Whereas a horse who's turned out on pasture with relatively dry environment may not actually uh, have the onset of CPL. So these environmental factors play a role in whether CPL actually starts or not. So again, there is currently no curative treatment for CPL. So what can we do to help our horses? At this point, careful management and supportive therapy can improve the quality of life for an affected horse. These treatments can be labor intensive and must be carried out during the whole lifespan of the horse to minimize discomfort but also to slow the progress of the disease and to avoid recurrent infections. These treatments focus primarily on wound and skin care, prevention of secondary infections, and additionally on controlling tissue edema. There are few ways to organically support your horse who is predisposed to or who has CPL. I've broken these tips down by the horse's environment, the horse's diet, and leg care. So let's start with environment. Provide room to roam. Standing still in a confined space without the ability to move is detrimental to the health of the horse's equine lymphatic system. Whenever a horse is standing still and unable to flex its fetlock joints fully, the mechanical retraction apparatus for removing the lymph from the lower limb is compromised. When possible, increase the level of turnout or find ways to encourage your horse to walk. Install a track system. Some track systems uh, can be found at Jamie Jackson's Paddock Paradise. That's a little reference for you. Reduce wet areas in your pastures, um, especially in high traffic areas such as shelters and water troughs by installing mud management grids or even gravel. A little warning, horses should never be fed on gravel as they can ingest some of those little rocks leading to colic and tooth damage. So you wanna be careful there. Have a well-defined and strictly enforced exercise program that includes daily or near daily structured exercise. Even if it's low intensity work, such as trail riding or in hand walking, and hey, it doesn't hurt us to walk, does it? We'll get our steps in and our horses too. Start all work, whether under saddle, under saddle or in harness with a long warm up and a long cool down. Provide shade from strong sunlight. If possible, provide a fan during the hottest days of summer. And for those who have white legs, use SPF 50 to 60 sunblock to protect unpigmented areas of skin in sunny weather control biting insects, hang fly control bags or strips, apply a good fly repellent all the time on the entire skin, including the affected limbs and the underside and underbelly and sheaths and teats of your horses. Mites thrive in straw. So choose an alternate bedding such as shavings or rubber floor mats. 
shavings can also hold moisture so they too uh, have their own pitfalls. Do not use leg wraps or boots that will retain moisture. Do not share boots between horses. Keep horses barefoot when possible. Regular farrier care is critical to these horses who have CPL as their hoof quality may be compromised due to lymphedema. Cleaning the hooves daily is important to check for the development of thrush as well. That's environment. So let's talk about diet. Provide access to free choice hay or fiber. The lymph vessels need the peristaltic action of the intestines to help them move. If worried about weight gain, try slow feeders or soaking the hay to remove nutrients prior to feeding or take advice from your vet or qualified nutritionist. Forage can be supplied as a pasture hay or hay alternative such as pellets or cubes. Well-maintained pastures should contain low sugar grasses and, um, you know, if the lower you cut your grass, the more sugars there, there are in your grass. So keep your grass high. Areas should not necessarily be lush. Uh, it should be more of like a low yield acreage. One step above a dry lot seems most appropriate for these horses. If you're unsure about pasture suitability, pasture ashes can be analyzed by a reputable lab to determine for non-structural carbohydrates. That's called NSC levels. You want to keep them around 12%, which seems to be most appropriate for draft horses. In addition to the nutritional advantages of turnout, forage allows for an increase in exercise, which is essential for all of our horses that need to be moving. For times when too much forage is available, a grazing muzzle can limit their intake. That helps out a lot. Hay and hay alternative sources, such as pellets and cubes, should be made from grasses and should also have an NSC level less than 12%. Appropriate hay is often mature and in most cases should be selected over more energy dense, immature hay. Though all hay should be free of mold, dust, and foreign material. That goes without saying, of course. If a horse requires additional calories to maintain weight while, while exercising or breeding, a concentrated source of energy should be offered. Neither straight cereal grains, such as plain oats or textured or sweet feeds containing cereal grains should be fed. No sweet feeds. No sweet feeds or grain. A low starch, high fat feed formulated provides adequate energy for horses in the form of alternate energy sources, such as fermentable beet pulp or vegetable oil. Horses on all forage diets require vitamin and mineral supplementation for optimal health. A ration balancer will make up for any shortfalls in protein, vitamins, and minerals, and will not add significantly to the NSC content of the diet. Add herbs such as Hilton Herbs Immune Support System and Limb Support. You can provide vitamin E supplements that the most potent are those of natural nano-dispersed product called Nano E. Vitamin E should be offered at an intake rate of 1 to 1.5 IUs per milliliter of supplemental oil in addition to 2 to 3 IUs of vitamin E per kilogram of body weight. Are you lost yet? Please visit the blog, the Brabant Bulletin blog, on CPL and I have all the correlating measurements within our diet care suggestions. I'm not going to go too much into the weeds here. You can go read for it. In addition to antioxidant responsibilities, vitamin E is vital to immune and cardiovascular, circulatory, neuromuscular, and reproductive functions. So it's an all around great supplement to have. Leg care. Here we go. Keep your feathers clean. Use soft antimicrobial brushes like a veil dandy brush to keep the loose hair loose and dry. Apply some coat defense powder. Uh, this will help reduce fungus and bacteria growth. As a little tip for any brush that you choose, be sure to run it across the inside of your arm first. If your skin turns pink or feels sore, don't use it. You don't want to break the skin of your horse. You don't want to use anything aggressive that's going to crack or break the skin because again, that leaves your horse prone to infections and then you're going to start that vicious cycle all over again. If you can keep the feathers clean and you don't have time to provide a routine care or your horse has open sores, clip the feathers. Shave off the feathers. Feathering, feathers, feather, feathering. I know there's some dispute about what we call that, but the leg hair. After clipping the leg feathering, apply a water-based antiseptic cream, a hydrogel, twice a day for 10 days to hydrate and protect the skin. This will also treat any nicks and cuts caused by clippers. If the feathering is muddy, wash them using room temperature water, never hot or cold as this can impact lymph flow. Don't use rough brushes or scrubbers to break the mud loose 
as they may break the skin. Again, you want to avoid trauma to the skin and you want to avoid causing any more irritations. Leave the skin free of bacteria infection. Remember that we want to actually leave it better than we, than we found it. Use a non-drying soothing shampoo that has an essential oil in it, like E3 tea tree oil or coat defense shampoo. If the legs have open sores, use an antibacterial or antifungal shampoo like E3 or chlorhexidine scrub, a hibby scrub to clean the legs. These shampoos can dry the skin, which can be detrimental. So use them sparingly. When using these shampoos, you got to use them sometimes twice daily for seven to 10 days. Lather for 10 minutes, rinse, pat dry, then decrease the frequency to two to three times weekly. If the lesions are still oozing, excadate, that's that foul smelling fluid, apply a stringent solution such as lime sulfur or aluminum acetate. If the skin is already dry, use a cream to wash the legs. Using an emollient cream like epiderm or eucerin, like we use on our babies, apply to the leg the same way you would to a soapy lather, gently rinse and pat dry using a clean microfiber towel. The cream will help remove mud and particles, but won't dry the skin like shampoos and antimicrobial soaps. As an aside, when I wash my horse's legs, I will use a leaf blower to help take all that excess moisture off. Um, Because the more dry you can get the feathering, the better after each treatment. This helps reduce the moisture that's sitting on the skin and prevent any like fungal infections from happening. You just have to be really, really careful. You don't want to scratch the horse's legs. You don't want to add additional trauma. You want to hand pick any scabbing or uh, crusty mud, and you want to make sure that the feathers are dry after shampooing. Now that we've addressed how to keep the feathering clean on your horse, let's talk about to compress or not to compress the legs with wrapping. It's important to avoid the use of elasticated products on the lower limbs as there is no musculature to guard against over compressing the deep lymphatic collector vessels. These vessels are very vulnerable to being constricted and research has shown that examples where elastic bandages have been effectively cut off lymphatic circulation. So if you don't know what you're doing, don't do it. Get with a licensed practitioner to do that. Also, other options from licensed practitioners to help your horse uh, through CPL is manual lymphatic drainage massage, the therapeutic compression wraps, as I mentioned, Dectomax treatments, Cydectin treatments, cold laser therapy, and MagnaWave PEMF. Listen, in the end, diligent management can improve the quality of life for CPL horses. It is not always a foregone conclusion that the horse is going to die. So at the risk of sounding hyperbolic, CPL is not a death sentence. If managed, a horse can be happy and healthy and live a fully productive life. In the meantime, we will continue to put our efforts into research, identifying that CPL gene, that elusive CPL gene, will continue to help support Dr. Marike Briss and her uh, studies and apply all that we're learning over time and continue to invest in opening our minds and continuing to learn. I hope that you've enjoyed this podcast and found it informative. Be sure to visit the Brabant Bulletin to see all of the supportive imagery, all of the referring documents and theories. If you want to go down that rabbit hole, I've got them all there. EuropeanBrabant.com, Brabant Bulletin, Understanding CPL. Okay, until next time, I hope you all are very, very well. 